what's in your book. Yes. Um, for a lot of people, this is a surprise, right? Yes. To read about what you were going through during those years. Um, can you tell us why you have chosen to be so public about this illness? Because I, I think there's been a stereotype that uh, DID, dissociative disorder, different personality, was civil. It was uh, three faces of E. It was something demon. It was wrong. And I, I'm saying, no, guys, it's not. I'm saying this may be God's guardian angel taking care of you until you can get help. <clears throat> but on the flip side of that, I said, now Satan has that same playbook of your life. Mm -hmm. And that's what you got to think about. And, you know, I have made doctors upset because of my view in the book. I made ministers upset because I said God, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are three different personalities. And even when Jesus was on the cross, you remember when Jesus was on the cross, he said, Father, Father, why have you forsaken me? Meaning he left his body and became somebody else only for a split second because of sin. But then he came right back again and said, you know, forgive them for they know not what they do. So I said, instead of demonizing, calling someone a demon, I call it someone crazy, I'm saying that they are free because they have DID. DID is a coping mechanism that they use to get rid of trauma that they've suffered not by the hands of themselves, or something that they've seen. So I said, it's God's guardian angel taking care of you until you can get help. So the reason I wrote the book is just to show people, you know, I'm not crazy. I'm not, I'm not a freak. I'm not, I am weird, but, you know, that's okay. <laughs> it is okay to be weird. Lots of people are weird. Yeah, a lot of people are weird. And, you know, somebody asked me, they said, uh, why did your former players know that uh, you had this? Now, you know, it was a fun, you're so crazy in college, they probably thought it was normal. They wouldn't have ever thought there was anything wrong with me. And I said, why would they know? Because all I was supposed to do is play football. Well, eight years ago, my life was in, my life went out, of, went out of whack. My life was going crazy. And I said, a man is not a man to say that I'm strong all the time, that I'm, you know, I'm always up. A man is a man when he can say, you know what, I'm, I'm weak, I don't know this. You know, a man is a man when he stopped and you're lost and you ask for direction. Because I've seen in movies that if you don't ask for direction, you go the wrong way and you're going to get killed. <laughs> so at best, ask for direction and know your journey. Mm -hmm. And a man is a man when he can read instructions on a box and put the toy together for his son. Not put it together wrong. And so I, I needed help. Eight years ago, I needed help. I was doing things that I was not aware I was doing. You know, my ex-wife told me things that I was doing. I'm like, no, I didn't do that. And that was an incident that happened in the beginning of the book that I speak about that I knew then that her said, this is wrong. And what's weird about it is I don't drink. I never taken, I never had a, I, I never had a beer. I don't take drugs, never had a drug. I never take, I don't even take medicine. Well, when this happened to me, I said, there's something seriously wrong here. And most of the time, people are not gonna ask for help. And I said, I gotta get help. This, that's, that's a problem here. <coughs> DID is social disorder. There's some alters, as you call it that may, and there's some altars, and, you, and people need to listen to this, there's some altars that will want you to kill, they want to kill you, kill the host, not knowing that if they kill the host, they kill themselves as well. But there's also altars that would do things and you're not aware of it. But then there are some that may tell it on the one that just did something. So that's what's so funny, it works like that in your mind. So in fact, it wasn't another person whose account you trusted, it was that within yourself, one altar speaking to another, you came to be conscious of things you yes. were doing. Of uh, something. Some things I was doing. But and what's weird is as I have written the book, it's been therapy to see now, as I look back over my career, and, uh, and I'll let you finish because I'm going a little too far, but what's weird about knowing that I had this, when I first heard about it, I laughed. Because at first, I went to the first thing I did when I was going wrong and things were just going out of whack, I went to see a minister. Because, you know, that's the first thing I was raised in the church. A minister is going to help you out. Well, he was, first of all, he betrayed my trust. And then they were going to do an exorcist. And I started laughing. Like, this has got to be a joke. And I left. Well, the first thing, when Dr. Magaza, Dr. Magaza, who helped me to understand that that's, this is what I had, when he first told me about it, I started to laugh. But then he started telling me the symptoms, what happens, and he asked me to go back because I write a lot. I write poetry. I write all the time. He said, take some of your writings you did a couple of months ago. Look at it then. Look at some of your writings a couple of weeks ago. Look at it today. And I started looking at it, and it all looked different. 
It all looked like it was written by somebody totally different. Then I went, uh-oh, that is something going on. But then I still said, that's not good enough. I said, no, Jerry, I need to go somewhere. I need to go see this for myself. So I took time and went out to a hospital out in uh, California. And I spent about 15 days at this hospital as an outpatient. But that was patients that were there. And one thing that brought it to life, life for me, but that was a young lady there that, and I'm just gonna call her Mary. I first met her when I first entered the hospital for my first uh, uh, therapy, therapist, for my first therapy. And her, she said her name was Mary. That was no big deal. Mary was sort of my group and we worked together. And I was gonna be there for 15 days. On the 11th day, Mary, I was coming down the hall and Mary said hello and I said, hello Mary, how you doing? And she looked at me. And she said, uh, my name is Joan. I'm like, oh, geez, this lady crazy. <laughs> and uh, so all of a sudden I go over and I ask the doctor and I said, uh, Mary just told me her name was Joan. And the doctor said, oh, it is Joan. I said, what do you mean? And he said, well, Mary, Joan was abused by her husband. And because of the abuse, Mary came out because she could take it. She wasn't going to put up with it. And she said, so Mary, Joan don't really trust men. So whenever she meets a new man, it's Mary that you meet. You don't meet Joan. But once you get that she trusts you, Joan comes out. And that's when it brought to light that this is something real. This is not a joke. This is not a game. This is something real that I have this. So my next thing is, hey, horse, now what do you do to get rid of it? What do you do to get rid of it? Well, you don't get rid of it. What you do is you embrace it. And the way I embrace it is instead of looking at a glass being half empty or half full, why are you not saying, I'm blessed to have water? I'm blessed that I have these altars. The reason why, and people say, oh, Herschel, why would you say something so awful? Well, you know, first of all, I won the Heisman Trophy. I got a scholarship to go to college. I played in the NFL. Not saying I'm wealthy, but, you know, I'm not like I'm out here having the want for money. I, uh, I, I've got a business that is doing very well. I got a beautiful little boy. So I'm not going to trade that in. I'm blessed. Even though now there's a flip side where the bad side, where I lost my wife, I lost a lot of friends, but I said, that's okay. Because I'm still not in jail. And my wife stayed with me to help me. So I said, instead of me just sitting here crying about it, laying on the floor being a baby, like you got to get up and do something about it. You know, sometimes we would pray and lay in bed and think it's going to fall out of the sky and hit us on the head. It don't work like that. You got to get up and do something. So I use that same motivation I used as a little kid to work out, which, and I, so I started thinking of this now. I just figured it out today, and I'm going to make more doctors a little upset. Because most doctors sometimes that that know someone that's being bipolar or schizophrenic. They're totally different things. It will give you medicine when you don't need medicine. Mm -hmm. Well, today I was figuring this out just for athletes. So I didn't even ask Jerry about it, so he probably didn't get mad that I even said it. But I said, you know what's so funny? You ever heard Michael Jordan talk about when he played basketball? He get into this zone that nobody can really touch. You can't see the zone. That's, that's totally true. You get this adrenaline in your brain that it's, a, it's like a high. And you become like Superman. Now, so that adrenaline could be what DID really is. And then you are, you got to realize that you got to take that adrenaline and get rid of it. You can't take it home with it. Because a normal person couldn't, they couldn't understand. They'll think you're weird. They'll think you're totally out of your mind. And that is one reason I have said to most professional sports teams, do not let your athlete talk after a game. Because when they speak, you think they're an idiot. And if they're not an idiot, their mind is in a totally different world. They can't think. You know, how in the world can you ask a boxer, after he's just been knocked out, what, how did it go? <laughs> 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 that, is, that is crazy.